And so I'm back, because I couldn't leave you wondering for too long what happened to the murder case of Madame Espanay and her daughter, who killed them. Will Mr. Dupin be able to find out the truth, or will the mystery of their brutal killing forever remain a mystery? Murders on Rue Morgue Part 2 As you remember, in Part 1, I told you the story of how, one hot summer morning, I and my friend, August Dupin, read in the newspaper about a terrible killing. The dead persons were an old woman and her unmarried daughter, who lived alone on the fourth floor of an old house on the street called the Rue Morgue. Someone had taken the daughter's neck in his powerful fingers and pressed with fearful strength until her life was gone. Her mother's body was found outside behind the house with the head nearly cut off, the knife with which she was killed was found, however, in the room on the floor. Several neighbors ran to the house when they heard the women's cries of fears. As they ran up to the fourth floor, they heard two other voices. But when they reached the room and broke down the door, they found no living person in the room. The Paris police did not know the answer. I told Dupin that it seemed to me that it was not possible to learn the answer to the mystery of these killings. No, no, said Dupin. I think you are wrong. A mystery it is, yes, but there must be an answer. We must not judge what is possible just by what we have read in the newspaper. The Paris police work hard and often get good results but there is no real method in what they do. When something more than simple hard work is needed, when a little real method is needed, the police fail. Sometimes they stand too near to the problem. Often, if a person looks at something very closely, he can see a few things more clearly, but the shape of the whole thing escapes him. Let us go to the house and see what we can see. I know the head of the police, and he will allow us to do so. And this will be interesting and give us some pleasure. I thought it strange that Dupin should believe we would get pleasure out of this, but said nothing. It was late in the afternoon when we reached the house on the Rue Morgue. It was easily found for there were still many persons, in fact a crowd standing there looking at it. Before going in we walked all around it, and Dupin carefully looked at the neighboring houses as well as this one. I could not understand the reason for such great care. We came again to the front of the house and went in. We went up the stairs into the room where the daughter's body had been found. Both bodies were there. The police had left the room as they had found it. I saw nothing beyond what the newspaper had told us. Dupin looked with great care at everything, at the bodies, the walls, the fireplace, the windows. Then he went home. Dupin said nothing. I could see the cold look in his eyes, which told me that his mind was working, working busily, quickly. I asked no questions. Dupin said nothing until the next morning, when he came into my room and asked me suddenly if I had not noticed something especially strange. I replied, nothing more than we both read in the newspaper. 
How shall we explain the horrible force, the unusual strength used in these murders? And whose were the voices that were heard? No one was found except the dead women. Yet there was no way for anyone to escape. And the wild condition of the room, broken appearance of the body of the old lady, with its head cut off. There are so, these are all so far from what might be expected that the police are standing still. They don't know where to begin. Dupin looked at me and replied, These things are unusual indeed, but they are not deep mysteries. We should not ask what has happened, but what has happened that has never happened before. In fact, the very things that the police think cannot possibly be explained are the things which will lead me to the answer. I believe they have already led me to the answer. I was so surprised. I could not say a word. Dupin looked quickly at the door. I am now waiting for a person who will know something about those murders, these killings. I do not think he did them himself, but I think he will know the killer. I hope I am right about this. If I am, then I expect to find the whole answer today. I expect the man here, in this room, at any moment. It is true that he may not come, but he probably will. But who is the person? How did you find him? I'll tell you while we wait for the man we do not know. For I have never met him. I will tell you how my thoughts went. Dupin began to talk, but it did not seem that he was trying to explain to me what he had thought. It seemed that he was talking to himself. He looked not at me, but at the wall. It has been fully proved that the voices heard by the neighbors were not the voices of the women who were killed. Someone else was in the room. It is therefore certain that the old woman did not first kill her daughter and then kill herself. She would not have been strong enough to put her daughter's body where it was found and the manner of the old lady's death shows that she could not have caused it herself. A person can kill himself with a knife, yes, but he surely cannot cut his own head almost off, then drop the knife on the floor and jump out of the window. It was murder then, done by some third person or persons, and the voice is heard were the voices of these persons. Let us now think carefully about the things people said about those voices. Did you notice anything especially strange in what was told about them? Well, uh, I said yes, everybody agreed that the low voice was the voice of a Frenchman, but they could not agree about the high voice. Uh-huh. That was what they said, yes, but that was not what was so strange about what they said. You say you have noticed nothing that makes their story very different from what might have been expected, yet there was something. All these persons, as you say, agreed about the low voice, but not about the high, hard voice. The strange thing here is that when an Italian, an Englishman, a Spaniard, and a Frenchman tried to tell what the voice was like, each one said it sounded like the voice of a foreigner. How strangely unusual that voice really must have been. Here are four men from four big countries, and not one of them could understand what the voice said. Each one gave it a different name. Now I know that there are other countries in the world. You will say that perhaps it was the voice of someone from of those other lands, Russia perhaps. But remember, 
not one of these people heard anything that sounded like a separate word. Here the pen turned and looked into my eyes. This is what we have learned from the newspaper. I don't know what I have led you to think, but I believe that in this much of the story, there are enough facts to lead us in the one and only direction to the right answer. What this answer is, I will not say. Not yet. But I want you to keep in mind that this much was enough to tell me what I must look for when we were in the house on the room work. And I found it. Japan continued. Let us now take ourselves again in our thoughts to the room where the murders were done. What shall we first look for? the way the murderers escaped. All right, we agree, I am sure, that we do not have to look for anything outside of nature, for anything not having a real form or body. The killers were not spirits. They were real. They could not go through the walls. They could not go through the walls. Then how did they escape? There is only one way to reason on the subject, and it must lead us to the answer. Let us look, one at a time, at the possible ways to escape. It is clear that the killers were in the room where the daughter was found. From this room, they must have escaped, but how? At first I saw no way out. It had been necessary for the neighbors to break down the door in order to enter the room. There was no other door. The opening above the fireplace is not big enough near the top for even a small animal. The murderers, therefore, must have escaped through one of the windows. This may not seem possible. We must prove that it is. There are two windows in the room, both of them, you will remember, are made of two parts. To open the window, one must lift up the bottom half. One of these windows is easily seen. The lower part of the other is out of sight, behind the big bed. I looked carefully at the first of these windows. It was firmly closed fastened, like the door on the inside. To keep the window closed, to fasten it, someone had put a strong iron nail into the wood at the side of the window in such a way that the window could not be raised. At least it seemed that the nail held the window closed. The nail was easy to see. There it was and the people who discovered the killings used their great strength and could not raise the window. I too tried to raise the window and could not. So I went to the second window and looked behind the bed at the lower half of the window. There was a nail here too, which held the window closed. Without moving the bed, I tried to open this window again, and again I could not do so. I did not stop looking for an answer, however, because I knew that what did not seem possible must be proved to be possible. The killers, or, or perhaps I should say the killer, for I am almost certain there was only one, the killer, escaped through one of these windows. Of this I felt certain. After the murderer had left the room, he could have closed the window from the outside, but he could not have fastened it again on the inside. Yet anyone could see the nails which held the windows tightly closed. This was the fact that stopped the police. How could the murderer put the nail back in its place? Well, uh, I said, perhaps, perhaps if you pulled out the nail... Yes, that is just what I thought. Two things seemed clear.
First, there had to be something wrong with the idea that the nails were holding the windows closed. I did not know what was wrong. Something was. Second, if it was not the nail which were holding the windows closed, then something else was holding them closed. Something hard to see, something hidden. So I went back to the first window. With great effort, I pulled out the nail. Then, I again tried to raise the window. It was still firmly closed. This did not surprise me. There had to be a hidden lock, I thought, inside the window. I felt the window carefully with my fingers. Indeed, I found a button, which, when I pressed it, opened an inner lock. With almost no effort, I raised the window. Now I knew that the killer could close the window from outside, and the window would lock itself. But there was still the nail. Carefully I put the nail back into the hole from which I had taken it. Then I pressed the button and tried to raise the window. I could not. The nail also was holding the window closed. I said, then, then the murderer could not possibly have gone out the window. He could not have gone out of the window, continued Dupin. Therefore, he must have escaped through the other window. The other window was also held closed by a nail, but I knew I must be right. Although no one else had looked carefully at the window behind the bed, I went to it and tried to see whether the two windows were in some way different. The nail in the second window looked the same as the one I had just seen. I moved the bed so that I could look closely. And yes, there was a button here too. I was sure I was right that without touching the nail, I pressed the button and tried to raise the window. Up it went. As the window went up, it carried with it the top part of the nail, the head. When I closed the window, the head of the nail was again in its place. It looked just as it had looked before. I took the head of the nail in my fingers and easily came away from the window. I saw that the nail had been broken, but when I put the nail head back in its place, the nail again looked whole. What seemed to be not possible, we have proved to be possible. The murderer indeed escaped through that window. I could not see in my mind what had happened. It was a hot summer night when the murderer first arrived. He found that the window was open, open, to let some of the fresh night air come in. Through the open window, the murderer went in and came out again. As he came out, he closed the window, perhaps with a purpose to do so, perhaps by chance. The special lock inside the window held the window firmly closed. The nail only seemed to be holding it closed. And that which was possible looked not possible. Dupin had been talking not to me. It seemed that he was talking to himself. His cold eyes seemed to see only what was in his own mind. Now he stopped and looked straight at me. His eyes were now hard and bright and I understood that using his unusual reasoning power to find the answer to those bloody murders was giving Dupin great pleasure. At first I could think only of this. Then I said, Dupin, the windows are on the fourth floor, far above the ground, even an open window. Yes, interrupted Dupin. That is an interesting question. How did the murderer go from the window down to the ground? 
Once I was quite certain that the murder had in fact gone through the window, the rest was not so hard to know. And the answer to this question told me still more about who the murderer was. When you and I first came to the house on the Rue Morgue, we walked around the house. At that time, I noted a long thin metal pole which went from the top of the building to the ground. A lighting rod. Here, I thought, this is a way for someone to go up or down the wall and then to go in or out the window. He would have to be very strong but it's not impossible. Although certain animals could easily go up the pole, not every man could do it. Only a man with very special strength and special training. This told me more about what the murderer was like, but I still had the question, who? Let us look again, continued Dupin. I want you, therefore, to forget the idea in the minds of the police, the idea that a desire for money was what they call the motive, the reason for the murders. This idea rose in their minds when they heard how the money was brought to the house three days before the killings. But this is only what we call a coincidence, two things happening at the same time but only by chance, and not because of some cause, some cause that brought them together. Coincidences happen to all of us every day of our lives. If the gold was the reason for the murders, the killer must have been quite a fool to forget and leave it there. No, I don't think the desire for money was the reason for the killings. I think that there was no reason for the killings, except perhaps fear. Now let us look at the murders themselves. A girl is killed by powerful hands around her neck, then the body is placed in the opening of the fireplace, head down. No murders we usually hear about are like this. There is something here that does not fit our ideas of human actions, even when we think of men, the most terrible kind. Think also of the great strength which was necessary to put the body where it was found. The strength of several men was needed to pull it down. There are other signs of this fearful strength in front of the fireplace. Some grey human hair was lying, thick pieces of it, pulled from the head of the old woman. You and you saw the blood and the skin with it. You know, you know, you know and I know, that great force is necessary to pull out even twenty or thirty hairs out at one time. A much greater force was needed to pull out hundreds of hairs at one time. Also, the head of the lady was cut almost completely from the body. Why? To kill a woman with a knife, it is not necessary to cut her head off. If now added to all these things, we add also the condition of the room, we have put together the following ideas. Strength more than human, Wildness less than human, a murder without reason, horror beyond human understanding, and a voice which made no sound that men could understand. What result then have you come to? What have I helped you to see? A cold feeling went up and down my back as Dupin asked me the question. A man Someone who has lost his mind, I said. A, a madman, a madman, only a madman could have done these murders. I think not, Sandy Pat. In some ways your idea is a good one, but madmen are from one country or another. Their cries may be terrible, but they are made of words, and some of the words can be understood. 
Here, look, look at this hair. I took it from the fingers of the old woman. The hair of a madman is not like this. Tell me what you think it is. Depan, this hair is, this hair is not human hair. I did not say that it is. But before we decide this matter, look at the picture I had made here on this piece of paper. It is a picture of the marks on the daughter's neck. The doctor said these marks were made by fingers. Let me spread the paper on the table before us. Try to put your fingers all at the same time on the picture so that your hand and fingers will fit the picture of the marks on the daughter's neck. I cannot, no, but perhaps we are not doing this in the right way. The paper is spread out on the table, the human neck is round. Here is a piece of wood, about as big as the daughter's neck. Put the paper around it and try again. Go on, try. I tried to put my fingers around the piece of wood as if it were the girl's neck, but still my hand was not large enough to equal the marks left by the killer. Japan, these marks were made by no human hand. No. No, they were not. I am almost certain that they were made by the hand of an orangutan, one of those men-like animals that live in the wild forests. The great size, the strength, the wildness of these animals are well known. Now look in the book by Cuvier. Read. Look at the picture. And at once I knew that Dupin was right in everything he said. The color of the hair, the size of the hand, the terrible strength the wildness of the killings, those sounds which were voice but were not words, everything fit nicely in its place. But not, not everything. Japan, I said, there were two voices. Whose was the second voice? The second voice, yes. Remember, we decided that only someone with a very special kind of strength could have gone up the lightning rod, up the side of the house to the window on the fourth floor, perhaps an animal, perhaps a strong man from a circus, perhaps a sailor. We know now that one of the voices was the voice of an animal, an orangutan. The other was the voice of a man. The voice spoke only two words. They were, my God, spoken in French. Mon Dieu. Upon those two words, I have placed my hopes of finding a full answer to this horrible question. The words were an expression of horror. This means that a Frenchman knew about these murders. It is possible indeed it is probable that the Frenchman himself did not help the orangutan to kill. Perhaps the animal escaped from him and he followed it to the house on the remorque. He could not have caught it again. It must still be free somewhere in Paris. I will not continue with these guesses, for I cannot call them more than that. If I am right, and if the Frenchman did not himself help with the killings, I expect him to come here. Read this. I paid to have this put in the newspaper. I took the newspaper and read the following. Caught. Early in the morning of the seventh of this month, a very large orangutan, the owner, who is known to be a sailor, may have the animal again if he can prove it is his. But to Pan, how can you know the man is a sailor? I do not know it. I am not sure of it. I think the man is a sailor, however, a sailor could go up that pole on the side of the house. Sailors travel to strange faraway places where such things as orangutans can be found, if I am right. 
think for a moment, the sailor will say to himself, the animal is valuable, why shouldn't I go and get it? The police do not know the animal killed two women, and clearly somebody knows I am in Paris. If I do not go to get the animal, they will ask why. I don't want anyone to start asking questions about the animal, so I will go and get the orangutan and keep it where no one will see it again until this trouble has passed. This, I believe, is how the sailor will think. But listen, I hear a man's step on the stairs. Dupin had left the front door of the house open, and the visitor entered without using the bell. He came several steps up the stairs, then stopped. We heard him go down again. Dupin was moving toward the door, when we again heard the stranger coming up. He did not turn back a second time, but came straight to the door of our room. In a strong, warm, friendly voice, Dupin said, Come in, my friend, come in. Slowly the door opened, and in came a sailor. Yes, the man who entered was indeed a sailor. He was a large man and strong. He carried a big, heavy piece of wood, but no gun. He said to us in French, Good evening. Sit down, my friend. I suppose you have come to ask about the orangutan, a very fine animal. I have no doubt that it is a very valuable animal. How old do you think it may be? We have no place for it here. You can get it in the morning, of course, if you can prove that it is yours. Yes, yes I can. I wish I could help it. I would like to have it. I, of course, I will pay you for finding and keeping the animal. Anything. Anything within reason. Let me think, what shall I ask for? I know. Let this be my pay. Tell me everything you know about the murders on the Rue Morgue. As quietly as he had spoken, Dupin walked to the door, locked it, and put the key in his coat. At the same time, he took a gun out of his coat and placed it on the table. The sailor's face had become red. He jumped to his feet and reached for his stick of wood, but in the next moment he fell back into his chair, trembling. His face became quite white, bloodless. He spoke not a word. His eyes were closed. My friend, you must not be afraid. We are not going to hurt you. I know very well that you yourself are not the killer, but it is true that you know something about him, or about it. From what I have already said, you must know that I have ways of learning about the matter, ways you could never have dreamed of. Now I know that you yourself have done nothing wrong. You didn't even take any of the money. You have no reason to be afraid to talk and tell the truth. It is a matter of honor for you to tell all you know, and you know who the killer is. So help me God, I, I'll tell you all I know about this, said the sailor. All I know, but I don't expect you to believe one half of what I say, not one half. Still, I didn't kill anyone. And I'll tell the whole story if I die for it. It was that animal, the orangutan. About a year ago, our ship sailed to the far east, to the island of Borneo. I had never before seen Borneo. The forest, the jungle, was thick with trees and other plants, and hot and wet and dark. But we went, a friend and I, we went into the forest for pleasure. There we saw this orangutan, a big animal. But we were two and we caught it. We took it with us on the ship. Soon, however, my friend died, and the animal was mine. But it was very strong and caused a lot of trouble. 
In the end, I brought it back to Paris with me. I kept it in my house, in my own house, carefully locked up so the neighbors could not know about it. The animal had cut one foot badly while on the ship. I thought, I thought that as soon as I got well, I would sell it. I was certain it was of great value, and it was so much trouble to keep. I wanted to sell it soon. The night of the murders, very late, I came home and found the animal in my bedroom. It had got free. I don't know how it held the knife in its hands and was playing with it. I was afraid I didn't know what to do. When it saw me, it jumped up, ran out of the room, and down the stairs. There it found an open window and jumped into the street. I followed never far behind, although I had no hope of catching it again. The animal, with the knife still in his hands, stopped often to look back at me. But before I could come near enough to even try to catch it, the animal always started to run again. It seemed to be playing with me. It was nearly morning, but the streets were still dark and quiet. We passed the back of a house in the Rue Morgue. The animal looked. The animal looked up and saw a light in the open window of a room high above. It was the only lighted window in sight. The animal saw the metal pole went up it easily and quickly and jumped into the room. All this didn't take a minute. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I could do. I followed the animal. I too went up the pole. As I am a sailor, it was easy for me. But the open window was far from the pole, and I was afraid to try to jump. I could see into the room, however, through the other window, which was closed. The two women were sitting there, with their backs to the windows. Who can guess why they were not sleeping at that hour of the night? A box was in the middle of the floor. The papers which had been in the box were lying around the floor. The women seemed to be studying some of these. They did not see the animal, which was just standing there, watching, the knife still in one hand. But the old woman heard it, and turned her head, and saw the animal there, knife in hand, and then, then I heard the first of those terrible cries. When the animal heard the old woman's cry, it caught her by the hair, and slowly moved the knife before her face. The daughter, filled with terror, fell to the floor and remained there without moving. Her eyes closed. The old woman continued to cry for help, screaming with fear. I think the animal now was as afraid as the old woman was. With terrible force, it pulled out a handful of hair, and when the woman, covered with blood, tried to run from it, the animal caught her again by the hair with one move of its arm, and it nearly cut her head from her body. Throwing down the body, the animal turned and saw that the daughter was moving, watching it with horror. With fire in its eyes, it rushed to the girl, put its powerful fingers around her neck, and pressed them firmly there until she died. When the girl stopped moving, the animal dropped her body to the floor and looked up. It saw my face in the window. It began to run around the room quickly without purpose. It jumped up and down, breaking the chairs, pulling the bed to pieces. Suddenly it stopped and took the body of the daughter, and, as if to hide it with terrible strength, it put the body up above the fireplace where it was found. All this time I was hanging from the pole, filled with horror. It seemed I had lost the power to move, but when I saw the animal coming toward the window with the old woman's body, my horror became fear. I went quickly down, I almost fell down the pole, and I ran. I didn't look back. I ran, oh my god, my god. 
the chief of the police was not happy that the answer to the mystery of the killings had been found by someone who was not even a policeman. He said that people should keep to their own business. Let him talk, said Dupin. He'll feel better for it. And he's a good fellow. But he makes things less simple than they really are. Still, people call him skillful and even wise. I think they say this because of the way he explains, carefully, fully, something which is not here, or there, or anywhere, and says not possible about something which is there before his eyes. See you in my next video.